Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly Beatles show that centers around what's going around in the Beatle world, Beatle news-wise, that is. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of this show, best known for my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, being joined by Mr. Beatles Examiner and person who writes for more examiner columns than anyone on the face of this earth and that being steve marinucci hey ken hey everybody hey i'm building you up here yeah you are aren't you, you are. appreciating you, that i know <laughs> i'm gonna have i'm gonna have i'm gonna have people looking me looking me up going wait a minute does he really do that many columns <laughs> and they're going to discover that he does that he does yes he does you are everywhere i am you are invading, you are taking over the Internet. God, I hope not. Completely. Oh, okay. All right. Whatever. On our show this time, uh, we were actually asked to do a show to honor George Harrison's 70th birthday, which was on February the 25th. And we're doing this a little bit later because we had some other shows that we had to get out of the way first. But we were kind of thinking, what would we do for George's birthday. And, you know, you can go in so many different directions, but we came to the conclusion that it might be a good idea for the two of us to come up with five songs that we would say are not necessarily our five favorite George songs of all time, but the songs that we kind of, um, you know, reach for the most. And there is a distinction between the two. I mean, I'm sure a lot of fans will say, well, how can you not pick while my guitar gently weeps or something or one of the the obvious you know those iconic songs my sweet lord whatever but these are the songs that we decided for whatever reason and we're going to discuss the reason why we tend to go to these songs the most the songs we gravitate to right if um if this was George Harrison's birthday and you were on Facebook and you wanted to pull a song from his catalog from the Beatles or solo what would you pick to represent you? And lots of people do that. You know, if right. you have friends on Facebook and they're Beatle fans and they're going to post something for George on his birthday, as many of my friends did already, what would it be for you? So the two of us are going to discuss our five choices and we're going to say why. So, Steve, you want to go one at a time or you want to just say all five of yours at once? Um, let's go, probably be best to go one at a time, okay. I think. And I'll start with Ding Dong, Ding Dong. Really? <laughs> which has always been a personal favorite of mine. Huh. I like the, it's a very buoyant song. It's George at a, in a very happy state. I like the fact that it's a, a New Year song. Yeah. Um, it actually has a kind of a Christmassy kind of thing to it, too, but it's because it's a, it's just a, you know, it's a very happy song, and, and, uh, well, you've so got you've got bells in there. That's why it's yeah, very it's Christmassy. Yeah, bells in there and everything. It's kind of a Phil Spectorish almost song, and um, it's always been one of those songs that um, that I can play and and uh, especially listen to the stereo mix and and really 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 just you know it just kind of makes me feel happy inside, and, and that's you know uh, one of that's uh, something that George does for me anyway, hmm. and but this particular song really kind of does that. It is very catchy, mm -hmm. and it is very much like a, I don't want to call it a chant, but it's just, you know, to say the same words over and over again. Right. I like that, ring out the old, ring in the new. Yeah, it's, uh, I can certainly see that. A lot of people list that as amongst their favorite George songs. Right. And he also has a lot of friends on that song. Mm -hmm. Ringo is on the song, Gary Wright is on the song, Jim Keltner is on it, Klaus Foreman is on it. And Alvin Lee is on it, and among others. So, well, you know, if you go through George's whole solo catalog, all of his friends <laughs> well, are on his albums. In this, you know. in this particular case, yeah, you know, you've got Ringo, and you've got Klaus, and you've got Alvin Lee, and you know, you've got a really tight new, knit group of friends there. Gary Wright. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, ding dong, ding dong. Okay, my first choice would be uh, "Your Love Is Forever." Okay. And uh, I picked that song because George is amongst the finest at coming up with great love songs. You know, it's it's kind of funny. 
John and Paul have written great love songs through the years. You know, Paul has that reputation for that especially. But George is just as great as far as I'm concerned. And I love the album that it came from because George was quite happy at the time. He had married Olivia. He'd written mm-hmm. some of the songs in Hawaii. You know, and it has that very Hawaiian laid-back feel to it. And just the melody of Your Love is Forever is so simple yet beautiful. And... um The lyrics are wonderful. Just everything about it. You can just relax and lay back and have a good time. And it's, you know, it's it's one of the many great love songs that he's done in his solo career. Right. Right. I just love the whole atmosphere of that album and especially that song. And and actually, there are times when, and maybe it might be fun for us to talk about this in the future, I like to talk about songs back to back that are really killer songs. When, when when you line them up, you mm-hmm. know after each other, and Dark Sweet Lady, going into Your Love Is Forever, it's two killer love songs, right? <laughs> and the production uh, on that album, as most of the the so- the albums that George uh, produced or co-produced on the Dark Horse label, the production is just wonderful too. Yeah, and the he, instrumentation, you know, he had a, he had a great way with production on those albums. Yeah, and also the slide. On you all of his forever, simple but really effective. I have to, I have to say that um, I, I have not played much in recent years, but I do play slide guitar, and George was a big influence on my on my playing. I never knew that. Yeah, you never told me. I never told you. No, you've been I, keeping this from me. Steve. I have been. I have been. But, and and um, from our listeners. I know it's it's been a long time since I've. Since I picked the guitar up, uh, and I should, I, I keep meaning to do it because hmm. I still have the guitars. I, I own a twelve string and a six string um, acoustic. I don't have an electric. But um, have you ever performed live? Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I won't say I was great. I remember. Um, no, uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember now. I, I remember playing in school. I remember. Actually, I was in a band for about a half a minute, and we actually played played uh, outdoors one time. And uh, but uh, we didn't last very long. Uh, I, I, the Beatles didn't have anything to worry about. But um, I, I played at that particular point. I was playing bass, which I was not really meant to, to play. But um, uh, slide guitar, I've always enjoyed. Um, uh, I've just it's just been one of those things that I've really liked. And then one of the one of the things I grew up on, some friends of mine were really into Elmore James, but that's another story in, in itself. Um, well, we're going to have to work into a, a live song from you one of these days. Oh God, <laughs> I'm going to drive everybody away if you do that. Anyway, let's get on to song number two. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, for me, it's not guilty, and the reason is because when I first heard that song, I heard it on the bootleg bootlegs surface well before George put the song out on his own, as I recall now. And um, Not Guilty was an interesting song for several reasons. Number one, the the melody, but also the words. Um, it was a, uh, a little stinger at, uh, at uh, the whole Apple situation. I always liked the song um, because of what it was. I just thought it was a great song. And... Um, is it one that that you wish the Beatles had released when they were together, as opposed to the anthology? Um, I have a whole, you know, I have a whole issue with the way the anthology was put together and was built, and you know, uh, I, I, it's hard, it's hard to say. Uh, it's probably not. I think I like the bootleg version better than George's version, only because it has a little more meaning in the bootleg version. Uh, because that's when it was, but uh, I guess I, you know. Uh, either way, I suppose. Um, but I, I, I do remember here. It, it had quite an impression on me when I first heard it. I remember. I remember that. Mm. Well, I'll tell you. The first time I ever heard "Not Guilty" was the version on George's album, mm-hmm. and that's always been my favorite version. Okay. I think okay. it works for me better when it's. A softer song, more actually, you know, it has a lot of bite when the Beatles did it. 
Right. But it was that guitar riff was used way too much on the Beatle version, I think. Oh, uh, he obviously re you know reproduced it. Uh, you know, did a took took a different um, method. You know, with it. Uh, you know, when he decided to produce it on his own. But, right. But um, either way, whatever. Okay. Your, your turn. <laughs> I'd say it may be an odd choice to some people, but I love Run of the Mill. Okay. The, the whole All Things Must Pass collection is just wonderful from start to finish. And there are the obvious songs like My Sweet Lord and What Is Life, which I, I love to death. You know, they're not only great songs, but they were great singles. But Run of the Mill is a rather odd song, it's just structured very differently. And I love the words. You know, mm -hmm. no one around you will carry the the blame for you. No one around you will love you today and throw it all away. There's a lot in that song. You know, it's another philosophical song from George. Not so much uh, preaching how people should be, but it's just one of the many songs in the uh, kind of like think for yourself vein. You know, everyone has choice when to and not to raise their voices. It's you that decides. Right. I love the words in that song, and the right. melody is just so unusual. You know, it's it's a very odd song, and yet there's something about it that that draws me in every the, time I hear it. There's no it, other song that sounds like that one. It has a very meditative quality to it. Hmm. Um, a lot of George's songs do. Well, I know, I know, but in this particular case, especially with what you just cited, it has a uh, a lot of. There's a lot of. There's a religious aura there that uh, sticks out a little more than on that song than on some of the other songs. It just, uh, yeah, it just seems that way to me. Hmm. It's just one of those songs. That it kind of reminds me, in its own way, of Think for Yourself in terms of what he's saying. Kind of like, everyone is responsible for themselves. Okay. Don't blame other people. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I just, um, I love the words of that song. Has a lot of meaning to me. Right. Your third song? Third song is All Those Years Ago. You're picking the singles, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. Um, this one is, is for you know, a couple of reasons, because of the, the tribute to John, the, um, the fact that uh, George Ringo, Paul, and Linda, and Denny Lane, and Ray Cooper, and are all on this thing together. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because uh, George, Ringo, and Paul are on it together, that's you know pretty pretty significant on its own. Um, it's uh, a nice tribute to John. It's not not as emotional as Paul's, but it's it's you know it's understated and it's um, it's just a nice song. Um, it's just, he, it just his uh, low key is George being low key, hmm. and and it's I think it's really uh, you know kind of a pretty tribute. I don't know if it's low key. I think it's a very personal thing. Well, yeah, you know, I just mean, to say that he that he was the one that he looked up to, mm -hmm. and uh, giving him a lot of credit. You were the one who imagined it all. Right. Right. You know, so I think there are some real heartfelt lyrics in there, but. You know, the thing about all those years ago, sometimes you don't want to know the whole history <laughs> behind certain songs, but it, it started out being a song that George wrote for Ringo with a different set of lyrics. Right. That doesn't make it less of a song that he reworked it, because it, it does work in this vein. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very effective for what it had done. Right. Okay. There we go. All those years ago. Okay, my third choice is That's What It Takes. That's another song. I was talking about the one-two punch, two songs in a row, that really works so well together, Dark Sweet Lady going into Your Love Is Forever. Every time I put Cloud Nine on, my favorite moment is going from That's What It Takes to Fish on the Sand. I just think those two songs, I don't know what it is. They, I look forward to hearing both songs so much. They really complement each other. I love the melody of That's What It Takes. I love the guitar duel, if you want to call it that, between George and Eric Clapton towards the end. Mm -hmm. I love that little bridge in the middle that Gary Wright actually helped to write with, with George mm -hmm. and Jeff Lynne as well. 
just love the whole feel of that song and the production behind it as as well as the whole cloud nine album you know it's just a real catchy song one that i love to sing along with and i don't know it's just one i never get tired of and then i have to hear fish on the sand after that <laughs> <laughs> okay next speaking of cloud nine get the next song would be someplace else wow and um I I did I like the way that uh, I mean I I had kind of mulled around picking um, cloud you know something else cloud nine or something but someplace else just is is kind of very understated and it's but it's very powerful the the album itself I I love the album as a whole uh-huh. um, but someplace else the song is just just a great little song mm-hmm. um, it's just an understated you know it's it's just part of the it's part of the key is of what makes that album so great. Uh-huh. Um, there's several things that you could, you know, that you can pick in on that particular album. Everything. There's so many songs on that album. I mean, that album is just a great album. But um, that one uh, just kind of is just one of the better parts of that album. It really is. Yeah. The interesting thing about Cloud Nine for me is the the album that, you know, George can make a very commercial sounding album and it could be really strong. And at the same time, he can make an album that is not commercial at all. And what he's saying in the songs is far more important, mm-hmm. whether it's philosophical or spiritual or whatever. I mean, living in the material world, well, actually, that album is commercial in a number of ways. Son Tropo is probably the uncommercial album if you're going to pick one. I don't know about that. I mean, really? every every song to me really is catchy. It's another very laid back album, like the George Harrison album was. Mm-hmm. But you know, certain songs like "Mystical One" is a very catchy song. "Wake mm-hmm. Up My Love" is a, is a catchy song. "Dream George. Away" is very catchy. Oh yeah. You know, "Gone Trapo" itself, the title track, is a catchy right. song. And I love "Grease" as an instrumental. It's uh, I, there's a lot of commerciality in that okay. album. But I'm saying there are times when he can make albums that are less commercial yet just as powerful if not more so Mm -hmm. but in the case of cloud nine it was such a commercial album and yet it was very um diverse musically because you also have a song like breath away from heaven where you have the this oriental side of george Mm -hmm. and actually you know that was in shanghai surprise as was someplace else You've got a song like um, Wreck of the Hesperus, which is a very funky track. You've got a very bluesy song like Cloud Nine. You've got a nostalgic song like When We Was Fab. You've got a poppy song like This Is Love. You've got a country and western song like Fish on the Sand. You've got a gospel-y song sort of like um, Just for Today. You've got a rocker like Devil's Radio. You've got a great ballad like Someplace Else. You know, you have all these songs in there. It's, It's very wide and diverse in, in in range there and in you know different styles of music and yet it's extremely commercial and it works and let me let me interject just to, for anybody that doesn't have it I'm sh- most people I'm sure probably do but if you can find a cheap and you should be able to find a cheap copy of Shanghai Surprise on DVD get it ignore the movie and and listen to the music <laughs> because there's some great George Harrison music there that he did not put a soundtrack out on and and uh, it's well worth hearing, uh, especially the title song, which I which I've always loved. It's such a great song. Oh, of Shanghai Surprise. Right. Yeah, I like that one too. There's also a very odd number there. A very um, what would you call it? Uh, I'm thinking of Hottest Gong in Town, mm-hmm. which is very much going back to like 30s, 40s music, big right. band. Again, you know, George Harrison was far more eclectic musically. Uh, than most people realize and give him credit for. Right. And, yeah, he really uh, was because he had so many uh, such diverse musical influences. Start, you know, um, starting with you know his deep love of Indian music. Right. And he, you know, he knew how to, you know, he he brought all that in through his music, and that's one of the remarkable things about his work hmm. is that he did do that. So. That's for for anybody that is looking for something, you know. George was George George's music was complex. It was not simple, 
And that's one of the beauties of it. Some of his music is very complex. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking in terms of um, the arrangements of some songs, the chords that he used. He used very odd chords in his songs. True. He was the master of the diminished chord, yeah. which for a lot of people who don't know, um, you have major chords and minor chords, and major chords are usually very uh, happy. <laughs> I don't know right. if I should use the word happy, but minor chords are sad. A diminished chord is twice as sad. <laughs> right. And he was the master of using that in, in songs, and he liked to use different chords, very odd chords, that nobody else would. And a lot of that would be like sevenths and ninths. Not that other people didn't use it, but he, he the way that he played it he, the, and the way that it was voiced and the way this, the, the notes were placed on each other. Right. He would use certain notes in the root of the chord that would be different to go along with the chord itself. You know? Um, just trying to think. Well, I, I, I mean, had just I just seen a video where, where George is going through this guitar can't keep from crying. Right. And, that, one, that one that just came out recently. Yeah. Right. And he was talking about a uh, seventh chord, but he placed a note I think it was an uh, an E major seventh with an F in the root, which is very unusual. It's just doing little things like that that make a big difference in the songs. Well, I mean, the the you know the the big example I can think of right off the top is is that opening chord to a hardest night that everybody's oh, yeah. always in you know, that has gotten a lot of discussion. You know, people trying to figure out exactly what it is. I mean, that in itself is kind of amazing. Right. But, uh, and, and, you know, for a, a, one chord like that to provoke all that discussion over all these years has been, has been absolutely amazing. But yeah. it has. So. But, um, it's, you know, a lot of George's songs are far more complex, you know, and, and sometimes when you have different time signatures, you know, a song like Here Comes the Sun, mm-hmm. it's not as easy to play as you think. No. It's only when you're in a band and you're trying to play it, then you realize <laughs> it, it's hard to duplicate the way the mm-hmm. Beatles did that song. And uh, George and John were very big on time signature changes. Yeah. You know? they, definitely, they definitely were. You could, uh, yeah. So, they, you know, I mean, some songs are simple and some of them are, are not. And it's very deceptive with George's music. Right. Right. So whose turn is it now? <laughs> I think it's mine because I think I'm, we're on number five. No, I didn't say my fourth one. Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. Go. Okay, my fourth one is The Light That Has Lighted the World. Ah, okay. Another song, well, first of all, I don't know if you know this or not, Steve, but my favorite album of all time from any artist is Living in the Material World. Um, I love the spiritual side of George, Mm. and there's a lot of spiritual music on many of his other albums, especially All Things Must Pass, but I think the, the songs on living in the material world are the most, the most spiritual and the most personal mm. and the most intimate. And uh, he's just saying what, how he feels at that moment, how the world observes him. I've heard how some people have said that I've changed, that I'm not what I was, how it really is a shame. You know, the fact that he is changing in life. I mean, he's not the beetle like he was in previous years. He's right. learning, he's evolving, he's growing. Mm-hmm. and he's grateful to the people who recognize that, right. who want to see him see the, the light that has lighted the world. So it's a powerful statement, and it's, it's just as powerful as what John was saying in Plastic Ono Band right. with a song like God. That's George from the heart saying he, how he felt at that moment in his life and probably how he felt throughout his solo career. Right. So, And songs like Be Here Now is, is so intense and powerful as is who can see it those are the songs that mean the most to me on that album and the light that is light of the world is one of those songs where again i love the melody nikki hopkins does a great job on the piano Mm -hmm. it's it's actually very simple what he's playing but it's just right Mm -hmm. nikki hopkins had the right touch same thing with what nikki hopkins did on jealous guy he was just the perfect piano person for that song. And he doesn't overdo it. He doesn't try to overshadow the song. He just plays the right part. And I loved what he played on that song. 
same as who can see it but uh yeah that particular song is one that always grabs me it gets me in the gut okay <laughs> song number five from you well if there's a gut-wrenching song for me this is it and it's marwa blues mm, very I, nice choice there then that has has always just knocked me out every time I've, I've heard it. It's just such a gorgeous song. I, I mean, there, there's not much more I can say. It's just such a beautiful song, um, you know. And uh, coming in the middle of that album, which, you know, posthumous albums like that are not usually expected to be as good as they were, but Brainwash was just so darn good. Mm. It really, um, it really was just fantastic, and it's so nice to have that song as part of it because it was such a great song. And it's um, nice to hear a song where it's all slide guitar. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just wonderful. I think that's another reason too, because of my my you know my love for, for slide guitar. I didn't tell you, by the way, that um, back you know when I was playing slide guitar, and I don't think it's so true anymore they used to recommend, well, you could buy steel slides. But um, if you wanted to play glass slide, the way you would get a glass slide, and I'm, like I said, I'm not sure if you can even get them anymore, is a Coruscant bottle. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it said since that Coruscant bottles were just the right for those. Um, the gla Obviously, the glass ones. I don't know if they even make Coruscant in glass anymore. But back in the, back in the, you know, the 70s when I was playing, they did. And obviously they were really easy to get. Mm -hmm. So there's a little secret for those of you that are interested in playing. If you can find a glass Coruscant bottle, there you go. I okay. think Clapton used that too. Um, but okay. anyway, back to Marwa Blues. It, yeah. It's just a gorgeous song. It's just really, really fantastic. So. I think Olivia said that uh, that song is like it's like a plea. Or it's like mm -hmm. a prayer to the heavens, and it, it sounds like it. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, it's just absolutely gorgeous, and, and very wisely placed in the middle of that album. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so my final song is "That Is All." Uh huh. That is all to me is the greatest love song that George wrote in his solo career, and possibly of all time. And it's one of those songs where, and, and you can apply this to any artist that is a favorite of yours. If there's a particular artist that it doesn't have to be the Beatles or the solo Beatles that is a favorite of yours and you've studied their catalog and there are certain songs that were not hits or not album cuts that got airplay and you think it's one of the best and should be recognized, that is all to me is such a, a beautiful melody. It is of the quality to me of something. Something is just the one that everybody points to, and there's no taking away the fact that Something is a great song. And as a matter of fact, Something is one that has emerged over the years and being recognized as one of the greatest of all the Beatles recordings, and rightfully so. I would not take away anything from that song, but that is all is just a gorgeous melody, a beautiful love song. You know, It should be one that is a standard today. Mm -hmm. I, I wish that that song had been a single. It's one of the many solo recordings I wish from, from many of the Beatles that were singles, although it is really on the slow side. You know, I don't see it as being as commercial a song from Living in the Material World as uh, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long would have been. But mm -hmm. that is all deserves to have been a single and even if it wasn't as big a hit i think over time people might recognize that it is of the caliber of something or of the best of george's songs especially love songs okay i mean just listen to the lyrics <laughs> that right. is all i want to say our love could save the day that is all i'm praying for to try to love you more i mean just beautiful words you know, and they flow so well, and the melody is just an, an absolutely beautiful melody, and it's just a crime that that song, and it's one of many that that's just not recognized from the solo catalog of the Beatles. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, and George has written a lot of great love songs, as I've said before. You know, Your Love is Forever is amongst my favorite. Um, Dark Sweet Ladies right up there. So uh, that is all. Learning How to Love You is one of my favorites, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was that... going to mention as an honorable mention, Cheer Down, mm. which also tugs at me. I don't know why I didn't put it in. in I mean, if I, if I could have had six, that would have been number six. But um, that one uh, really tugs at me every time I hear it. Um, the, the, the slide solo on that one is just astounding. As far as I'm concerned. I agree with you. And the one thing about Cheer Down is is that he really does a lot of playing on the slide. Right. George is so well known for having a short guitar solo. Mm-hmm. He's economical. You know, he packs a lot with a few bars of playing. But on Cheer Down, he lets it loose. You know, and uh, if you really want to hear some great guitar playing from George, pick Cheer Down. That's one that if, um, you know, if, you ha- if I have a fantasy of playing a song live that would be the song i would like to play live mm-hmm. just because just because of it's such a great solo and how about marwa blues then i mean that's another great example of a slide guitar playing um yeah but but um cheer down rocks cheer down rocks yes okay i think that i think that's probably a better a better answer yeah it really does hmm so okay and i suppose if i got an honorable mention I would pick Learning How to Love You. It's just another okay. song. That's another song. That's an unusual song in terms of the chord sequences. Uh, it's a very unusual melody. It's uh, It has real jazz overtones to it. Okay. It's one of those songs that definitely could lead in a jazz direction, uh, possibly because of the chords that George uses. Right. You know. So... Uh, Learning How to Love You is another one that's certainly worth discovering. And uh, every time I hear it, it's like, it's such a, a beautiful song. It grabs me, you mm-hmm. know, right in the heart. So those are the songs that we picked. We'd like to hear from our listeners uh, as far as this particular category is concerned. Pick some of your favorite George Harrison songs. Not necessarily favorite. Songs that you tend to play the most. And there is a distinction between the two. You know, I think most people would probably place those iconic George songs, like I mentioned at the start of the show, something, Here Comes the Sun, those songs, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, as being amongst their favorites. But if there's some songs that are album cuts or songs that are not recognized, lesser known songs that mean a lot to you, and I'd like to know why, too. We yeah, both let would. us know, and maybe we'll put some of them up on the on Facebook. We'll mention you on Facebook. And we may even, who knows, um, we may even mention it in a future show. Who knows? Okay. And you can write to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And if you want to get in touch with us, there are many different ways you can do so. And since uh, Steve is a part of every website on the internet, <laughs> If you could just narrow it down to a couple ways that people can get in touch with you. Well, they can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. You can catch me on Facebook on my on my personal page. Uh, you can talk to us through the uh, Things We Said Today page on Facebook, the radio show page. Mm-hmm. Um, and, we're, and I'm also on Twitter under my name again. So you get... You, there's several different ways to catch me, and feel free, and and I'll I don't and I don't bite. I will. I generally I'm, I'm pretty good about answering people back. So if you have a comment or a question, you know, feel free to to ask, and and I'll be glad to answer it. And we enjoy answering these questions too. We do, especially when people ask our advice mm-hmm. on certain things, what books to get, what what songs do we like the most or albums you know we enjoy answering those that's right we do so as far as i'm concerned there's a few ways you can get in touch with me my email address is every little thing at att.net you can also get in touch with me on my uh, facebook page ken michaels and then there's my website ken michaels and uh, i should say if you've never looked at the website before there's a lot there for Beatle fans to uh, feast on. <laughs> there's lots of 
Well, I should. I'll plug your site and say he uh, just put up the the Tony Sheridan interview. Um, to, was it today or yesterday? Yes. Uh, yesterday. He just put up the Tony Sher- Sheridan interview we talked about, and we played a little bit of last week. Is the whole thing there, Ken? I think. I think you most said- of it is, but everything that has to do with his time with the Beatles and the songs that he recorded with the Beatles, that's on the website. Okay. And uh, the clip that we played last week, if you didn't hear last week's show, you can still catch it on iTunes or on Podbean. Um, it was really amazing what he got Tony to talk about. So uh, it's a great interview. Well, you know what it is? You know, sometimes interviews remind me of <laughs> of music or, or, well, all kinds of art, really, because right. this is the first time in over 20 years that I listened back to the interview. And I realized that he said some insightful things that I didn't, maybe I didn't pick up on the first time. It's kind of like you you, I was going to ask you about that. It had, you had not heard this since you had recorded it, correct? Yeah. Well, well, I played it on the air 20 years ago. (laughs) Right. But I mean, since you, since you played it 20 years, I mean, you haven't played it since. Right. Okay. But there were certain things that maybe I didn't hear the first time around. Right. And just hearing little things like Tony used to teach the Beatles chords certain mm-hmm. chords and songs that you didn't you didn't you may not have known that before and just by doing some reading you you'll discover that Tony taught the Beatles certain songs that were hits in America right. he played a very big part in the early years well there's there. a, whole, a whole different perspective to listen to listening to it now as opposed to when he was you know when he was here hmm. but yeah I mean there's um, but it's it's really a very insightful interview and uh, so it's well worth it well worth catching right so thanks so much for tuning in and uh this is ken michaels along with steve marinucci for things we said today saying thanks for listening and we'll see you next time see you next time